Again, uh, Beatitudes, uh, it's Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, starting in the 17th verse. There is a primary theme that we're going to discuss here in the next 30-some minutes. It's a primary theme, and if you're a note-taker, I would encourage you to write this theme down because we're going to continue to come back to it over the next uh, several minutes. The theme is this. There are two heart perspectives that are being unveiled in these verses. Two heart perspectives. The one is the heart of man, where mankind, meaning us, mankind, is always at the center of the story and suffers because the efforts always fall short. Again, let me repeat that. The heart of man is where mankind is always at the center of the story and suffers because his efforts always fall short. We call that the letter of the law. The other is the heart of God, where God is at the center of the story, and mankind flourishes because God's efforts always succeed. We call that the heart of the law. So you have the letter of the law and the heart of of the law. Let's unpack this. Jesus begins Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you until heaven and earth disappear not the smallest letter not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. Now there was perhaps a notion that as Jesus was starting his ministry, as he was starting his career, as he was going about and teaching, that he was sort of giving an eye wink to the idea of the law. Like he was one that said, sort of implied, the law doesn't matter anymore. Uh, in fact, there's some shortcuts and we can cut some corners and you're taking it too seriously. It's not at all what he was doing. He was doing actually the opposite. He goes, guys, if you think I've come here to abolish the law, now you're wrong. I've actually come here to fulfill the law. And then he goes on over the next several verses. Let me take a minute and sort of give us all a little history of what we mean by the law. The first time we see any expression of the law of God is back in Genesis chapter 2. It goes way back and we find ourselves in a situation where God has created everything and as he's created everything, he says, now that I've created everything, everything is good. In other things, everything was absolutely perfect. There was no murder, there was no jealousy, there was no deception, there was nothing. It was absolutely perfect. And he looked at mankind, Adam and Eve, and he says, guys, I've created this perfect world, and I'm giving it to you. I'm the creator, you're the created, I'm giving this thing that I've created, I'm going to give it to you. And you guys can manage it, you can enjoy it, it's yours. He says, but I've got one thing. There's this one thing I don't want you to do. And he talks about this one tree, this one tree that he says, I do not want you to partake of this. But other than that, you can do everything you want. So here's this perfect world. It's yours for the taking. I love you. Manage it well. Just don't do this one thing, one law. Well, we know the story. We call it the fall because they fell into sin. They fell into saying, hey, well, if God said don't do it, we're going to do it. And they did it. And as a result, there was consequences, which God had said. If you do that, there will be consequences. I'm the creator. I've created this. You're the created. I've asked you not to do this. And if you do, there'll be consequences. Certainly, that's what happened. They did it consequences. So then everything begins to fall apart. 
Read the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, read the whole thing. The whole world begins to fall. All the bad stuff starts happening and all the things that we live with in this broken world that we live in, it was that happened as a result of sin. So this, this thing called sin entered into mankind, into this perfect world. And then we fast forward really, really fast and we go all the way up to the story of where the children of Israel were in captured, enslaved in Egypt. We know the story for four, up to 400 years and God sends Moses to take them out of slavery of Egypt and give them into their own land and give them their own identity, give them a new purpose, a new promise. So he pulls Moses to draw them out, takes them all the way into the desert, getting ready to go into the promised land and he now says, okay Moses, I need to reintroduce the law, I need to reintroduce sort of a manual of how do you do life if you've been in captivity for 400 years, you're the people of God, but you've lost your identity, you lost your purpose, you've lost your guidelines. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take the owner's manual and I'm gonna give it back to here's how to do life. And this is what we call the 10 commandments. And then from that, uh, Moses and, and uh, the uh, various uh, uh, prophets and so on began to add to that. So we ended up having literally hundreds of laws, but all based out of those 10 commandments. If you want some interesting reading, go read the book of Leviticus. And there'll be all kinds of specific laws. This is how to eat. This is how to treat your spouse. This is how to raise a family. This is how to deal with conflicts. Everything, just like an owner's manual. So he says, okay, do this. And if you do all this, you can take this broken world that's completely broken, but this sort of gives you the owner's manual on how to navigate this. Well, again, what you read throughout the Old Testament, ne they never did it. They would it. The story is just over and over. They would try, fail, deal with the consequences. God would forgive them. They would try again. They would fail. They deal with the consequences. God would forgive them. It goes on and on and on. And yet throughout that whole story, the prophets, we would hear, there was a promise God said. And God says, guys, I am going to fix this. And I'm sending my son. And he's going to come and he's going to fix this. And this is why Jesus says, guys, I've not come here to abolish the law. I've actually come here to fulfill it. The thing that you can't do, I'm going to come and do. It goes all the way, as we continue to move forward in that, it goes all the way, if you uh, want to make a note, look at it later, but Matthew 22, so this goes a little bit farther into Jesus' ministry, uh, one of the religious leaders, one of the Pharisees, come up to him and go, hey, uh, rabbi, teacher, uh, I got a question for you. You, are, you, know, you say that you're an expert of the law, you say you're here to fulfill the law, that you're not here to abolish the law, even though, in, in our opinion, we feel like you break the law a lot. Um, we got a question for you. Uh, Rabbi, teacher, what would you say is actually the most important? If you had to boil all these laws down, what would you say is actually the most important law? And Jesus answers this way. He goes, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So we take the initial one law, don't eat of this tree, to the Ten Commandments and all the other laws to now back down to just two. This is Jesus, who is God, saying, okay, if we had to summarize this entire narrative, love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I am almost 60 years old. Next month, I'll be 60. Um, when I was five, I prayed, Jesus, come into my heart. Didn't know what I was doing at the time, but it was the start of a journey with the Lord. And that means for 55 years, I have been a follower of Christ. And I can tell you with incredible assurance, at my word, my assurance, that I do not today love God with all my heart, mind, and soul. And I certainly... I can assure you that I do not love my neighbor as myself. <laughs> so, now once in a while I think about if I lived in a cave all by myself, I might get closer to the first one. <laughs> love God with all my heart, mind, soul. Because I'd just be in a cave all by myself. But the problem is God says, well, if you're going to love me with all your heart and mind and soul, then I actually want you to love your neighbor. I go, but yeah, but it's the neighbors that sort of tick me off. And it's my neighbors who ruin it for me. 
Like we ruin it for each other because what? We're all broken human beings trying to do this thing called life. You know, you bug me, I bug you and all this. So when God says, love your Lord with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. So, so here I have a dilemma. God said everything was perfect. Just everything's perfect. Then it becomes imperfect and he goes, okay, in order to make it perfect again, here's the law. So if you do all these things, it'll be perfect again. Great. I'm so sorry, Lord. I'm going to try to do everything. It gets complicated. All these laws and I get confused. And so we're blowing it. So sorry, God. I tried to blow it, tried to blow it, tried to blow it. So God says, okay, fine. Just, okay, here, I'll boil it down. Just love me with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. I can't do that, Lord. I try, but every 15 seconds, something happens that makes me realize. So, so here's what it is. So what the dilemma we have this morning, remember the heart of man and the heart of God, the letter of the law, the heart of the law. The dilemma is, he comes and says, hey guys, it would, this is what I would have loved him to say. Hey guys, I've come here, the law is a burden. None of us are able to keep the law. You've tried, I mean, I give you credit, you've really tried, but you blow it every day. Some of you don't even try anymore. You go, forget it, I, I tried that, I give up. Others, you every day, the religious leaders every day, studying and trying to do it and studying. And then they're looking at other people going, well, you're not following the law. And all. So he goes, okay, you guys have tried, but you keep failing. So guess what, guys? I've come here to get rid of it all. I've come here to abolish it. Oh, really, Jesus? Best news I heard, because I can't do it. I can't keep it. I am discouraged. I'm frustrated. This is the best news. He didn't say that. He says, oh, guys, I've come here. If you think I've come here to abolish it, mm -mm. I've come here to fulfill it. Okay, what does that mean, Lord? Because... I am very discouraged and hopeless. So, so here, let's get into details. If you're discouraged and hopeless, let's get more discouraged and hopeless. Okay, verse 21. He starts talking about some various moral codes. So, you know, he starts just getting in. Just imagine you're sitting on the side of a hill and Jesus is talking and, and this is, so he goes. Okay, so verse 21, we're going to talk about murder. He says, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. We get that. Got it. That's a bad thing. Murdering is a bad thing. Okay, we get that. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Excuse me? So you mean, because I was feeling pretty good about myself, Lord, because when I was looking at all the laws and realizing I break a lot of them, but the murder one I felt pretty good about, because I go, at least I didn't do that. I didn't murder somebody, Lord. He goes, yeah, but there's more to it. I go, what do you mean? If your heart is such that you hate somebody, and maybe you have good reason to hate them, you hate someone, or you're angry with them, or you curse that person, or you cancel that person, or you might say, you're an idiot, or you say something like, you're dead to me, or you have people like that that you've completely got rid of in your life. And Stefan, you're guilty of murder. Seriously, Lord? I mean, that's not the same. It is according to your, God's economy. Here's the thing. The heart of man always wants to discard. We want to cancel. We want to, dis, we want to just go discard. Like, you upset me. So, I mean, the ultimate expression of discarding is to murder somebody. I'm going to actually take that person's life away so they're no longer a problem. Remember we go back, we said the two heart stories. The heart of man is I'm at the center of the story, so you bother me, so I'll murder you and get rid of you so no longer you're a bother. Or the heart of God where he's at the center of the story and therefore he is there to help us flourish. So this is it. The heart of man is to discard, but the heart of God is to defend. Let me tell you a cool story about that. Um, Peter, we find this in John chapter 21. Again, if you're a note taker, um, Peter, we know the story of Peter. He was one of Jesus's disciples, one of his go-to guys, like in his inner circle. And the night that he was betrayed, uh, Jesus is saying, hey guys, I'm going to be betrayed and I'm going to die on the cross. And Peter stands up in front of his buddies, as you know the story, and he goes, ah, 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 ah. maybe those guys, but not me. I've got your back. I will even die for you, Lord. I've got your back. Count on me. And he goes, nah, you're not going to do that. He goes, yes, I am. He goes, nah, you're not going to do that. He goes, yes, I am. He goes, nah, Peter, it's not going to happen. Peter's like, yeah, well, I'll prove him. 
We know as we go through the story, a few hours later, he does exactly that. Peter denies Christ. He betrays him. Jesus gets crucified. He's buried. He rises from the dead. And several weeks later, he's on the Sea of Galilee. Peter and the disciples are fishing out there, not catching anything as usual. And Jesus helps them catch some fish. And he's on the side, and he started a little fire over here. He's got a little tilapia. He's cooking for the disciples. And uh, all of a sudden, Peter goes, it's the Lord. And he comes in, and Peter and Jesus sit by the fire eating tilapia. And the disciples are over here, you know, grabbing all the fish and doing all that kind of stuff. And, and basically what's happening is Peter and Jesus, Jesus is like, Peter, I'm good with you. We're, we're good. We're good, Peter. We're good. And he does it in front of his peers. The same peers that he goes, he, he had such a miserable fail. I mean, he stood up, I'll defend Jesus. And he publicly denied him. And you can just tell what they did with Peter's ego and his self-worth and his personality. And here he is, Jesus is in front of the other disciples going, Peter, I'm good with Peter, guys. I'm, I'm going to defend Peter. And what's so powerful about that is that Jesus so easily could have said, Peter, I got to tell you something. I counted on you. I counted on you. For three plus years, you were at my side. I counted on you. I said to you, I'm going to build my church on you. And you stood up in front of all the other interns, all the other disciples, said, Jesus, I got your back. And I told you, I don't think you have it in you. And you've argued with me. And I was proven right because you didn't have my back. And you know what, Peter? I know you wallowed in your self-pity and your depression and your, and your resentment and, and your regrets. But you know what? I went to the cross. And I died for mankind. And I rose from the dead. In fact, I didn't need you, Peter. I won. I don't need you. So, Peter, you messed up. See you later. You're a loser. That's what normally we would do. That's what cancel culture is. That's what you're dead to me means. I don't need you anymore. But Jesus doesn't do that. He goes out of his way to restore him. To defend him. Heart of God versus the heart of man. Adultery. It's only getting worse, guys. Okay. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. And everybody, yeah, not commit adultery. That's a bad thing. Ruins families, ruins marriages. Yeah, we get it. We got it. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has committed adultery with her in his heart. And then he goes on to say some really gruesome things. And he says this in verse, uh, let's see, 29. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. Now you can imagine if you're sitting there listening to Jesus, like you're looking at each other like, okay, it's better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown away. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. The heart of man is to devour. The heart of God is to delight. Now again, here's the law. The law was adultery was bad. In fact, the law was if you're caught in adultery, the penalty was death, particularly for the woman. Things weren't very fair back then. So adultery, bad, death. And Jesus comes along and says, guys, and you've got some of these religious people going, never did that. I don't commit adultery. Check the box. Green check. Green check. I'm righteous. He goes, um, it's not just the actual act. It's the fact that you think about it. In my economy, it's the same. Okay, then where everybody's guilty. He says, well, then gouge your eye out. Okay, take your eye out. Okay, then you, you have another lustful thought. Oh, Take the other eye out. Okay, I don't have any more eyes, Lord. What else do you want me to do? Because I still have the lustful thoughts. You understand he, what his point is? He's, he's driving the point that says, the law will never, ever, ever save you. Because you can look for all the nuances. So here's the story. The religious leaders, uh, most theologians think this is a setup. They find a woman in the ev- actual act of adultery, okay, set up, 
In other words, I don't want to get too graphic. It's still in the morning, but, and it's church, but they catch her and this man having sex, okay, in the act. Now, most, again, they believe it's some sort of a setup. The man somehow gets away with it. Okay, the woman, imagine this scene. They drag this woman out of this very awkward, intimate situation, catch her in the act, draw her out in a public setting. She's probably naked, overly ashamed, sitting there, not giving anybody any eye contact, sitting there, covering herself. The religious leaders in their robes and their purity and all their wonderful living, following the law, everything that God told us to do, pull Jesus aside. Okay, you're, some, you're the rabbi. Okay, we want your opinion on this. This woman is caught in the act of adultery. The result of it, Mr. Law Abider guy, is to kill her. Grab a stone, start throwing at her until you knock her in the head, knock her in the body, knock her in the head, knock her in the body, concussion, you know, broken skull, bleeding. I mean, it's a horrific way to die public, and they're, they're ready to do it. They're ready. Come on. It's time to do it, righteous Jesus. And the Bible tells this really cool story because he, he gets on his knees and he starts writing in the sand and theologians have been saying, what was he doing in the sand? You know, is he just ignoring them? Is he playing a game? What's he doing? And he makes this comment. He goes, hey, whoever is perfect and has no sin, feel free to pick up a rock and just, just whip it at her. Go ahead, do it. If you have no sin and you're perfect, go ahead. Now, in most cases, they would probably have just done it. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm righteous. That's all I do all day is just follow the law. Most people believe that whatever he was writing in the sand was probably identifying the sin that he knew that they had committed. Okay, so he's like, okay, I know what you did yesterday. I know what you're thinking right now. You over here, you're in trouble. Over here, this and that. And they're watching. This woman's like this, naked, ashamed, in front of these men. And all of a sudden, they're all running away. The very law that they thought was going to catch this woman and stone her to death actually was reversed in Jesus' economy, and they had to leave. And then he looks at her, and he says, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. See, the heart of man is to devour. When we think of lust, pornography, Think of other things. It has nothing to do with love. It's loveless. It's to take from this person for whatever desires you want and to take for your selfish ambitions, for your selfish desires, for whatever it is. And the heart of God is to delight. He looked at this woman and he probably took a robe and covered her. I can just imagine him grabbing her face and just looking at her and go, hey, I don't condemn you either. Now there's a better life for you. Don't do this anymore. Go and sin no more. Don't do this. You know what she felt like? You can imagine the emotions she experienced from going in the bed of a man to a public execution to then having Jesus just look at her and go, hey, you have a life ahead of you. Go live it. This is what God does. Divorce. Now, divorce. Well, you won't clap after divorce. Okay. Okay. Divorce. This one hits half of you. At least half of you. Okay. It has been said. Anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces a wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. What? That's why I said it hits most of you, or half of you, okay? So, okay, anyone who divorces a wife must give her a certificate of divorce. Okay, so typically what would happen in the law, again, we're going back to the law, the man, again, had a lot of rights back then, the man says, I'm tired of my wife, for whatever reason. It could have been legitimate reasons, not so legitimate reasons, I'm just tired of her, okay? I don't like her attitude, I don't like the way she cooks, I don't like the way her, she combs her hair, I don't like her, her sense of humor, I, I don't know, I just, I'm tired of her. So he would write it out, he'd take this thing, certificate, he'd go to the, I don't know, certificate of divorce guy, and then he would, um, 
get it probably like a you know, seal of some sort, notarized. And then he'd go to her and go, hey, hon, hey, hon, how's it go? Hey, here's your certificate of divorce, see ya. Okay, and, and, and he was considered righteous in doing that. Like he was like, hey, he did it though, he did it according to the letter of the law. I mean, he followed the rules, he got the certificate. And in her world was turned upside down because in that culture, again, women didn't have careers, women were completely dependent upon the man and the provision and so So now you take this woman who's being well cared for and now she's no longer. And not only that, her reputation has been ruined. So her life is completely destroyed because this righteous person decides on a whim that he's done with her. Now, what's interesting about that is the heart of man is to dismiss and the heart of God is to discover. Let me give you an illustration. The Bible often talks about how God is the groom and we, the church, you and me, the church, are the bride. It's an illustration. You have, we see it throughout scripture. He's the groom and, and we're the bride. Now imagine if God treated us in the, according to the law. Let's say God one day wakes up, and he's just, not that he sleeps, but he wakes up, and, um, and he just decides, I'm, I'm just sort of tired of stuff on. You know, I'm just tired of him. I mean, he's tells the same story over and over. There's nothing new. I'm just, uh, there were things I hoped he would have accomplished by now. He hasn't. He's got a bad attitude half the time. Um, he's inconsistent. I'm just sort of tired. So I'm just going to write him a certificate of divorce and just dismiss him. See you, Stefan. I hope it works out for you. You're on your own. No relationship with God. Hopeless. You're done. I mean, when your heart stops beating, it starts beating. And now I walk away with this complete, utter sense of hopelessness in my life. Even though I deserve it. There's no way I can please God the way he ought to be pleased at all. I don't care how much I try. No, he doesn't do that. We read about how he comes and he, as I said, the heart of man is to dismiss, heart of God is to discover. What happens when you give your heart to God? Remember, it's the heart of man and the heart of God. So the heart of man, you're at the center of the story. Heart of God, God's at the center of the story. You're still in the story, but God's at the center. What happens when I take my heart and I say, God, I want... I want you to be at the center of the story. All of a sudden, everything I was created to be becomes discoverable. In other words, I begin to flourish. My gifts, my talents, my attitudes, my perspectives, everything changes because it's not me, it's God through me. So when we're walking around with the burden of life and we're walking around with the sense of of not having identity, when we walk around life with no purpose, I mean, how, level, how high levels of anxiety are and suicide rates and alcoholism and drug addiction and all kinds of other addictions because we're trying to find some kind of ointment to fix the brokenness of our lives because we're miserable and we're discouraged and we're fearful of everything. We live in this, and, and that is not the way God created us to live. He goes, guys, just give it to me. Give your heart to me. And all of a sudden, he begins to discover everything he's created in us. Okay, keep going. Verse 33, oaths, meaning giving our word. Again, you have heard as it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. Verse 34, but I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne. And then he goes on in verse 37, he says, all you need to say is simply yes or no, anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Give me some context. In those days, if you were gonna make a promise according to the law, there was a certain way that you had to do it according to the law. Okay, I'm gonna make a promise. So Stefan's gonna make a promise to my wife, Lisa, and I'm gonna do it according to this. Now, when I do that, I am bound by that. I mean, that is a covenant. I am bound by that law. There is no wiggle room. There is no getting out of it. So what people would do, because they didn't want to have, they didn't want to be bound like that, they would still make a commitment, but they would do it not according to the law. They would do it like another way. So for example, you could say, I'm going to swear I'm telling the truth based upon the temple or based upon, you know, whatever. They'd make something up. 
So is there a sort of way to come across like I'm giving a vow and I'm coming and I'm, I'm, I mean what I mean, but in reality, I didn't really mean it. I wasn't going to come through. I was, I was looking already for a way to sort of get out of it. Like, like I like it, but I don't like it. I like the benefits of what I hope to get, but I don't want to be fully in. I'm not all in. And he goes, guys, you're missing the point again. It's not like I'm going to follow the law, but the condition of my heart is I don't have any intention of doing this. He goes, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. In other words, be a man or a woman of such integrity that if you say your yes, if Stefan says yes, then that means I really mean yes. It doesn't mean I'm just giving you lip service. Here's where we feel guilty, and I, I do it daily, okay? You come up to me and go, hey, pastor, and I'll usually say, just call me Stefan, and then you'll say, pray for me about this job interview I have tomorrow, okay? And I'll say, yeah, okay, I'll pray for you. Now, I'm getting better at it. Trust me, but I forget, you know, and then the person will come back and say, hey, Stefan, thank you so much for praying for me because I got the job. And then I'll have to say, honestly, I forgot. I didn't pray at all. So my prayer didn't help you in the least. So, because I don't want to take credit for the prayer. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I was praying for you. Now, what I do take a moment is I take a note, like I have a way now, if you say that, I'm going to actually say, well, what's your name? And I'll, I'll make a point of praying. I want to do that. But that's an example. Like I want the accolades of looking like I prayed for you. Oh yeah, I'll pray for you. But then I really didn't pray for you. Okay. So you understand what the Lord's doing here is just looking at our heart constantly, looking at the heart. Let's go to, um, can you imagine, for example, the heart of man is to deceive. I want you, I want you to think of one thing about me, but reality, I'm, I'm somebody else. But God says, let your yes be yes or your no be no. The heart of God is to deliver. Think of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. We covered this a week or two ago. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Satan comes to him and basically says, look, I know you're on this mission from God, okay? But I got another way to go about it. Like, you don't have to go to the cross and do that. So here's some things. And he sort of offers them some some detours, some decoys. Hey, what about this? And what about this? And what about that? And he doesn't take the bait. Jesus doesn't take the bait at all. Think about, go fast forward, the night that he was betrayed, Garden of Gethsemane. Okay, Jesus is sitting there with his interns, his disciples, and he's alone and he's praying. And if you remember the prayer, what was recorded is this. Father, I don't want to do this. Please take this cup, take this responsibility from me. I don't want to do it. And then he pivots immediately and says, no, not my will, but your will, Father. What was his will? If you were to interrogate Jesus, hey, what do you mean when you said not my will? What was your will at that moment? At that vulnerable moment, what was your will? Honestly, my will was to abort mission. I didn't want to go through with it. I mean, I'd been doing this for 30 years. I love Peter and James and those guys and mankind and but in my human flesh I just didn't want to do it I was done I was I was petrified I was scared in the human flesh he couldn't do it in the human flesh you and I can't do it but then he that's why he pivots and he goes but not my will but your will father God gave him the strength to fulfill it this is the same thing we talk about let your yes be yes and your no be no last but not least verse 38 and verse 4 uh, 38 through 42 or so, talks about revenge. You have heard that it was signed an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to the other, turn and give him the other as also. But if anyone wants to sue you, take your shirt and hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. The heart of man is to destroy and the heart of God is to develop. <coughs> so, let me unpack. So when, you know, it doesn't make sense. Because we get the revenge. You know, I mean, there's a culture. If you do this for me, you punch me, I'm going to punch you right back. You know, you punch me a little bit, I'm going to punch you harder. But he goes, no, if someone slaps you on the face, let them slap the other side of the face. Like, what? And he goes, yeah, and if someone wants your coat, give them your shirt too. What? And then if you, someone wants to you, you carry your burden for a mile, walk two miles. Now let me unpack what's happening in that culture. The Jewish people hated the Romans. 
The Romans were an occupying force that lived. So imagine we had an occupying force living here in South Florida. And they told you how to live your life, when to live your life. They, they controlled everything. And at the whim, they could take your life or imprison you. And you live then. And there's people all over the world that live into that kind of culture. Okay? Imagine that. So this, they hated the Romans. Hated the Romans. So there was this thing that a Roman soldier could do. A Roman soldier could be coming home with his backpack. He's got his backpack. He's on heading home. And there's this Jewish father over here coming home, carrying his groceries. And he's got his kids getting home. They're ready to go home for dinner. And they're heading this way. And the Roman soldier's going this way. And the soldier could take off his backpack, look at the Jewish guy, and go, hey, carry my backpack for me. The guy couldn't do anything about it other than pick it up. And he'd have to, by law, Roman law, not God's law, carry it a mile. So he'd have to say, okay, kids, leave the groceries, run home to mom, tell her I'll be a little bit late. He'd pick up this Roman's backpack, obviously didn't really happy about this, and he'd walk another mile. As soon as he got the mile, he'd throw the backpack on the ground, go back over there, pick up his groceries, and go home and have dinner. Okay, Jesus saying, <clears throat> understand what this is saying. I mean, it's messing with their head. Hey, if someone wants you to walk a mile, walk, walk two. Jesus, I didn't want to walk the first mile much less the second. And the guy that slapped me on the face, I didn't like it. It didn't feel good. You want me to slap on the other side of the face? Going again. The heart of God, the heart of man is to destroy. The heart of God is to deliver. Remember when Jesus was on the cross? He was nailed to that cross, beaten like a pulp. They say he couldn't even recognize his body. Romans are beating on him, people spitting on him, cursing him, calling him every name in the book. He's sitting there, and on a cross, you didn't just die because the nails were in your wrist. You died of suffocation, and you just died. And you're just dying, and people are just cursing. Look at him, he's such an idiot, he's such a joke. You save people, he can't even save himself. What a loser. And then he says, Father, forgive them, for, for they know not what they do. This is what he's talking about. He had every right to say, the Bible said he had legions of angels. When we talk about legions, we're talking tens of thousands of angels that could have come and rescued him in a way that no one's ever been rescued before. He could have just said, angels come. But he said the opposite. Heart of man is to destroy. The heart of God is to develop. So we conclude with something. He ends with this way in verse 43. <clears throat> love your enemies. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbors and hate your enemy. Everybody's like, I got that. I can love my neighbor. I hate my enemy. So far, you got me, Jesus. He goes, but I tell you, I want you to love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Now remember, they're under Roman occupation. So they, they, all of them had somebody in their mind. They go, oh, I know that guy's persecuting me. Think about it in our lives today. The Bible says something interesting in Romans, a couple places, Romans 8, Romans 5. But it says <clears throat> that because of the sin, you remember when Adam and Eve violated God's perfect law? Because of that, because of sin, the Bible says we are enemies of God. Now we've concluded here in the last 30 minutes that we have all sinned. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. I never murdered. You hated. I never committed adultery. You lusted. I never. Uh, 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 uh. No, guys, guess what? We're all sinners. And because of that, we're the enemy of God. Meaning that God wants nothing to do with us. Not. Nah. That would be the traditional sense of an enemy. But God says, love your enemies. Well, that's easy for you to say. Oh, no, guys, it's not. Because I have loved you. In fact, I saw this. And I saw you as my enemy. And the only solution, the only way I could solve this was to pay the price that I could be the only one to pay that price for. You couldn't do it. You tried and you failed and you tried and you failed. 
and I had to come and pay that price. So what could have been a very discouraging message where Jesus is just driving home the point that the law cannot save you, you cannot save yourself, and if you think you can, I'll give you a thousand examples why you can't. But then he puts his beautiful bow at the end because he talks about the love of God, his incredible love so much, and it ends with this verse. And Jesus says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Do you know that now, when God looks at me, because I've I've accepted this truth, I don't understand it, I am far from a person that behaves perfectly, but when God looks at me right now, because I have invited Jesus to Mark, Do you know that he sees me as perfect because of Christ? I am no longer his enemy. And he's not an enemy because, it's not like God's, God's an enemy because of our personality. It's because of the sin. It's when I am at the center of the story, the sin that encapsulates. And God says, let me take that sin. Let me take it and pay the price for it. Because Stephon, you can't pay the price for it. Let me take it away. And now God looks at me through the eyes of Christ and he sees Stephon as perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So now, we take the next few minutes in this service, and we do this thing called communion. And if you don't have one of these, raise your hand, and we'll make sure you get one of these. Because this is one of the best ways to end this message. Because it is an, it's an actual act that we will do to demonstrate the fact that we understand this. Now, if you are a person that says, honestly, I am not a follower of Christ. I'm still on the fence. I don't understand all this. Or I have some real reasons why I don't want to believe it. Then this is not for you because he says, do this in remembrance of me. This is for people who have said, I want Jesus in my heart. So if you don't have Jesus in your heart, this is not for you. Take some time to talk to him. Take some time to ponder on what we've talked about, but for those of you that call yourself a follower of Jesus, he sat there the night that he was betrayed, the night that, remember that whole night that Peter said, I got your back and all that stuff, and they were having their last supper, which was their Passover meal, which is a common meal, it's like they were like their modern day, like our modern day Thanksgiving meal, they're having a traditional Passover meal, and he takes the bread, which is this little wafer we're going to eat, and he takes the cup, which was Uh, what they were drinking in time, and he goes, hey guys, and he takes a bread and he breaks it, this is my body broken for you. Now he's referencing, guys, in a few hours, I'm gonna get pummeled and put on a cross. And he says, this is my blood that is being shed for you. And again, he's gonna be, they're gonna spear him to death and they're gonna just, his blood is gonna be shed. But the reason they understood it is because they understood that according to the law, remember we talked about the law, that until Christ came, the way they would amend themselves, the way they would you know, say they're sorry, is they would have to give a sacrifice. You have the, all these sacrificial laws and all these things. So they would actually have to take this little perfect lamb and they would sacrifice this lamb and it was an act of broken body, blood shed for you thing. So he's coming now as the ultimate lamb and he's saying, so they understand the metaphor when he goes, no, this is my body. I am the lamb of God. And it's come here, and it's going to be broken, and the blood is going to be shed so that you, disciples, and all of mankind, meaning us, that as we accept that, that we go back to what I said, that our sin, the thing that separates us from God, has been removed by God because he took it upon himself to pay the price that only he could pay. This is why we call it the gospel. You hear, have you heard the gospel? Has someone shared the gospel with you? You hear that kind of language? Gospel means good news. So this, it's good news. Because without it, I'm overwhelmed with the burden of the law, realizing I'm forever separated from God. But with it, I can stand tall, knowing that God looks at me through the eyes of Jesus and sees me as perfect. So take a moment. We're gonna sing a worship song. And take a moment. And at the time when you feel ready, you just open this up and just uh, take this little wafer and remember, be reminded that this is 
him saying, do this in remembrance. What are we remembering? Remembering that there was a man named Jesus who lived 2,000 years ago? Well, certainly we remember that, but we're remembering more than that. We're remembering what he did for us. And we make it real. So we take some time to think about it. Now, maybe in the process, it's your prayer is just a, a prayer of gratitude. Like, wow, Lord, I, I needed to be reminded of just what you've done for me. Maybe for some of us, we've held on too much to the fact that we're still at the center of the story. Hey, I, I can, you know, there's more good than bad. I think I can make this happen. I'm working hard. You know, I'm trying to be a good wife, a good husband, a good dad, a good mom. I'm trying to be good, God. I'm trying to be good. I'm so tired and I'm not so good. I'm calm and blow it or... Oh my Lord, if you just knew where I was last night, I'm so overwhelmed with guilt or the stuff I was watching. Oh my gosh, Lord, I can't believe. I, if people knew what I was thinking right now, they would throw me out of this church. This is where your head's at? If that's where you're at, do this in remembrance of me. He says, hey, take, take that junk, take that sin, take all that stuff and give it to me. Please, I'm asking you for it. And then he takes it. And he separates us. The Bible says he separates our sins as far as the east is from west. And now I'm clean, I'm pure, I'm whole. So let's take a moment, spend some time with the Lord. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still. going to close in prayer and um, when we're close um, after we say amen uh, those of you that feel like hey I need some prayer about something going on in my life there's going to be prayer counselors up in the front feel free to come forward if you're someone says hey I need to know more about what it's like to have Jesus in my heart I've got some questions again this is all done confidentially it's no it's all very private but they'll stay here as long as it needs. Now, I think it's pouring rain out, so you probably have nowhere to go. So this is probably a great time to take an extra 15, 20 minutes and say, I'm gonna spend some time with the Lord and pray and um, ask God to say, Lord, if there's something in your word this morning that you want to just like impact me with, let it not be forgotten. Let it be branded in my heart and my mind. So let's pray. Our dearly Father, we come to you now, this afternoon, and we are thankful for your incredible, incredible love. Lord, we have these finite minds that think we understand what love is all about. The love of a father or a mother or a spouse or a friend. And we, we sort of have an idea, but Lord, we have no idea. With no idea of the depth and the breadth of your love for us. And Lord, as we get these glimpses of it, as we read your word and we read about the law and we read about the right and the wrong and, and there's this temptation, there's this default mechanism in our hearts that we can do this on our own. I can do it. I can be a good person. I can be a good wife, a good husband, a good dad, a good 
mom. I, I can do it. I can be a good follower of Jesus. I can be a good religious person, Lord. All this stuff that just goes on. And that, Lord, the fact is, for thousands of years, we've never, ever been able to do it. And yet, you've never given up. You said, guys, you can't do it. I can do it, but you can't. So just let go. Release it. Let me do it for you. And Lord, I, that's simply, we collectively, all of us here, simply want to say that now, this afternoon. We, Lord, give you our lives. Take our lives and shape them and mold them into the life that you want. We surrender to you, Lord. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Guide us and lead us. Protect us from stupidity and foolishness. Give us an understanding of your word. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.